talk at the right time. Good morning, you're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First the headlines this morning. The early rises in Asia are all trading lower amid divergent global queues. Minutes of the Federal Reserve's December meeting suggest a more cautious approach by the FOMC to future rate hikes. Oil prices surged to a one-month high, continuing with their longest rally in 17 months. Prices entered a bull market. After a unanimous vote in the Lok Sabha, the reservation bill was passed in the Rajya Sabha as well with 165 members voting in favour of the legislation. And a robust growth in digital revenues coupled with a repeat tailwind may aid TCS in December. Uh, in the December quarter, rather, the IT major will report numbers after market hours today. Let's talk about that session in the US. Uh, US stocks continued to edge higher on Wednesday boosted by the optimism over trade talks and on indications from the Federal Reserve that it will remain flexible with its interest rate hikes. Taylor Riggs of Bloomberg News tells you what happened in that session. I'm Taylor Riggs with a look at where the U.S. markets closed. A very broad-based rally. All the indices, all the major indices traded higher. This is, of course, after we got the Federal Reserve meeting minutes from the December meeting. Those came out at 2 p.m. And the Fed said that they were a little bit more cautious on rate hikes than the market had previously estimated. And so those dovish and more cautious tones certainly helped fueled or extend the rally that we had already seen really in place for most of the day. Let me walk you through the numbers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed up about four tenths of 1% or about 92 points. The S&P 500 also up about four tenths of 1% or about 10 points. And the NASDAQ, this is key. That is the big outperformer here. You always want to see tech sort of lead the way to confirm that a rally is in place. And that was up about eight tenths of 1%. So very good sign, of course, that tech is leading the way. Interestingly enough, the Russell 2000, that's the small cap stocks or some of the more domestically focused uh, companies were the bigger outperformer here. Those were up almost 1%. You have that even though, of course, you had a weaker dollar coming off of those Fed meeting minutes. So sort of a U.S. centric view. And that rally, of course, in place today. Now, I mentioned the weaker dollar. So let me talk a little bit about that because you had a dollar that was firmly closing down near the lows of the session after the Fed, of course, was reiterating that they were a little bit more cautious on rate hikes. You also had two Fed speakers this morning that were dovish as well, further putting pressure on the dollar. You had the Atlanta Federal Reserve uh, president over there come out and say the next rate move could be a hike or a cut. And then we heard from the Chicago Fed president um, who said that we could see fewer hikes than expect, expected given some of the lower inflationary trends that we are seeing as well. Let me broaden this out and just sort of recap where the sectors were because sector performance was a mostly broad based rally as well. You had some of the riskier sectors like energy and tech lead the gains. Those were both up more than 1% within the S&P 500. And then some of the utilities and staples and real estate, which are some of the safer sectors or more interest rate sector sensitive, uh, those closed off anywhere from one half of 1% to 1%. And I mentioned interest rates because we are seeing rates fall a little bit today. You have the 10 year yield down back to 2.71%. And that's driving a lot of the action of what we saw in the financials. Now, even though there is some concerns over the flattening yield curve and these falling interest rates, you did have the financials outperform today. And that is interesting because you had a slew of downgrades in some of the financials on Monday, but then Wednesday, you had a lot of upgrades. You had Morgan Stanley and Bank of America those stocks were upgraded today purely a lot based on sentiment in the sector. It was so negative going back in 2018 that a lot of that sentiment really has now come full circle. And purely just based on a valuation perspective, analysts really coming out today and saying that the financials looked good on a PE, forward PE basis. You now have the financials trading at 10 times. That is low going back multiple years. So perhaps maybe the financials here have found a floor as we head into earnings season, of course, that kicks off off next week. And that is a look at your U.S. markets from New York. I'm Taylor Riggs.
Well, a comprehensive view there of the U.S. markets. Uh, we'll get back to a little more uh, about the uh, Federal Reserve minutes. But first, let's take a look at the Asian markets. The Asian markets have opened uh, uh, on a weak note uh, despite the steady close on Wall Street. Uh, I'm joined uh, live by Bloomberg's Rosalind Chin from Hong Kong. Uh, Rosalind, you've been listening to what's been said about the U.S. markets. Uh, surprisingly negative turn to the Asian markets at the start of trade today. Uh, what are you picking up? That's right. Uh, all the market gauges really uh, pointing down at this point in the session. Now, what we do have is, of course, you know, those much vaulted trade talks. We did see a rather tepid uh, um, statement coming out from China on that, uh, saying that uh, it was an extensive, in-depth and detailed discussion and did lay foundations to resolve issues of mutual concern. Not exactly a resounding positive there coming out of Beijing, even though the U.S. did try to push a slightly more positive uh, spin on it. You know, they are pushing China to uh, deliver on promises uh, and, of course, there is that March 1st deadline for officials to decide on any structural changes to China's economy. And, of course, they did also say that uh, Robert Lighthizer, the U.S. trade rep, is likely to meet Liu He, the vice premier of China, later this month. But um, not enough, perhaps, for the markets to really gain uh, a lot of um, comfort uh, from those comments. And then we've just had in the last few minutes some numbers out from China. We've got the consumer prices and also producer prices. Both of them were a miss. So, you know, another uh, bit of evidence as to that China's slowing economy as if we needed any more. But really, you know, both these numbers are a bit of a disappointment, even, uh, even uh, by the standards of the slightly downgraded estimates that we had seen for consumer and price, uh, producer prices out of China as well. So right now we're seeing the Nikkei down 1.5%. The topic's down by more than 1%. Shang, uh, the Shanghai Composite losing uh, just over a fifth of 1%. And the Hang Seng Index down by about uh, 0.8 of a percent at this point in time. In uh, Japan, we're looking at the yen. That is at 107.90 to the US dollar right now. We did see Goldman uh, coming out with some uh, lowered forecasts for Japan equities, but linked to Forex, basically saying that the yen strength is likely to persist. And that, of course, in the long term could hurt prospects for local corporate earnings. Um, Goldman Sachs sees a yen at around 105 versus the dollar. Uh, finally, a quick look at uh, oil, the WTI, giving back a few of those earlier gains, or rather gains from yesterday, but uh, still at uh, more than $50 a barrel, right now at $51.66 a barrel, uh, Brent at $60.74 a barrel. And that's, of course, after it looks like OPEC plus, you know, Saudi Arabia, Russia and their allies uh, look like they will follow through on their agreement to uh, curb output this year. Back to you. Well, it looks like we're speaking about similar things uh, the world over. We're going to speak a little more about crude as well. Thanks so much for that, Rosalind. Well, officials of the U.S. Fed expressed growing concern about the U.S. economy. This is coming from the minutes of the last meeting of the Fed that took place last month. There are concerns, uh, apparently, about volatile stock markets, trade tensions and signs of glo slowing global growth. The minutes revealed that the policymakers took a more cautious approach to further rate increases than their statement had indicated. Kathleen Hayes of Bloomberg News filed this report with more details about those Fed minutes. To remember after the December 19th meeting, the markets were all excited because they thought the Fed should have indicated more caution and patience on interest rate hikes. Look at the stock market had just done. It had been falling, falling, falling. Uh, and instead, the Fed chair came out at the press conference, sounded fairly bullish, and it took this this statement, several remarks at a panel on Friday for Jay Powell to signal, no, I, I see what you're saying, but don't worry, we're already in your camp. And that's what the minutes of the December meeting showed. A, lesson, a key phrase here suggesting the Fed knows it's going to wait and watch now here in 2019. Many participants expressed the view that especially in an environment of muted inflation pressures, the committee could afford to be patient about further policy firming, for, patient about further rate hikes. Um, in fact, Eric Rosengren, president of the Boston Fed, considered rather hawkish, in fact, was speaking to our own Michael McKee after a speech in Boston. And he was talking about how the Fed is trying to achieve its dual uh, mandate amidst uncertainty. And he is, I think, implying that he's probably in the mood for more rate hikes, but he knows this may shift. Let's listen to what Eric Rosengren said earlier. 
My guess is that over time we're going to see that in 2019 the economy is going to be reasonably strong, that the unemployment rate is going to continue to drift down from the 3.9 percent it is right now, and that the financial markets will recover. But I also realize that my forecasts can be quite wrong, and that the financial markets have such a different view, at least uh, until the last couple days, that it's been quite negative and quite volatile. Um, so I have to take those financial market considerations into account. Two other Fed Bank presidents, Evans from Chicago, Bostic from Atlanta, also indicating that there's a lot of uncertainty. The Fed can wait and assess whether they're going to hike or even cut rates, according to uh, Rob L. Bostic. Jim Bullard in the Wall Street Journal, Heine, apparently saying he's worried the Fed hikes rates too much. They're going to invert the yield curve and they could push the economy over into recession. Well, all right, that's the update coming in from the U.S., uh, especially talking about those Fed minutes. They uh, af affect us uh, based on the rise in the interest rates that you've seen in uh, that market, in that economy. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about commodities, about the trade setup for the day, and also to tell you uh, about the futures and options space. Agam Vakil is joining me now. Agam, well, the big one of the big talking points, because there are several today, is the fact that crude, mar uh, crude oil prices are back in bull market territory. They've gained about 22% since the lows that they saw around Christmas time. What are you picking up? Well, I wonder how that's going to affect the equity markets. But Alex, considering you've spoken about uh, commodities, let's address them and take a look at how they panned out. Uh, of course, Alex has spoken about uh, how oil is moving at this point in time. We're keeping an eye on, well, uh, a lot of the other commodities as well. So you do have metals uh, where, you, where gold and silver, along with platinum, are trending marginally in the red. And in terms of some of your key agricultural uh, well, stocks, what we're keeping an eye on is something like corn, or perhaps sugar and cotton. Sugar is one key watchable, considering we saw a surge a day before of as much as 5%. And uh, we're, we're starting to see some traction build up in the global sugar indices and markets. Uh, this is, of course, uh, as far as your base metals are concerned. So aluminium, copper, uh, mixed cues coming in, actually, except for something like a nickel or a copper, which is advancing. On the other hand, we're really not seeing too much uh, on ter in terms of uh, losers. But uh, that said, let's shift focus to uh, your equity markets. And, you know, the SGX Nifty, of course, at this point uh, is advancing by a qu well, about a quarter quarter percent and uh, we're going to keep an eye on this one but let's talk about uh, your uh you know, your, your indices. And we did see the Nifty advance by as much as half a percent, but the mid-cap and the small-cap indices were lagging and close in the red, with the Nifty banking indices also up and about, uh, moving, at least as far as the Nifty bank is concerned, not too much to speak for the NS, uh, Nifty ba PSU banking index. But um, your ADRs, and that's where we've seen some gains in Tata Motors and Wipro. In terms of losers, uh, let's take a look at those which have also lost out in trade, and HDFC Bank in Vedanta. So, well, a uh, fairly evenly poised when it comes to moves uh, in uh, the ADRs. Again, uh, we're in very small numbers, typical of what we've seen over the previous few weeks when it comes to FIs or DIs for that matter. But today, both of them have bought into on a net basis. Now, moving into your contributors, we do have HDFC, ITC, Access Bank, and HDFC Bank uh, providing the bulk of gains. On the other hand, you have Yes Bank and BBCL well, bearing down. Uh, keep an eye on Yes Bank because uh, we have more updates with respect to uh, the leadership uh, at the bank, uh, and we're going to keep an eye on that one as well. But moving on to futures and options space, and when it comes to the Nifty futures, more unwinding coming through even as the Nifty advances by around half a percent. The Nifty banking futures has seen more accumulation of as much as 6 percent uh, towards fresh longs. Your open interest distribution, uh, well, well, your maximum open interest hasn't changed. It continues to be, uh, remain with the 10,500 put and the 11,000 call. And in terms of changes in open interest, that's where we're seeing unwinding around the 11,200 call, but writing at the 11,100 call as well. And uh, moving on to your uh, stocks, which are still in the FNO band, the Sadani Power and Jet Airways, your India volatility index has declined by 3% to around 15.3 and your put call ratio has is up ever so slightly at around 1.4. Uh, also, the Nifty Bank uh, put, uh, put call ratio is at around 1.42, so watch out for that one. And moving into your other variables, we have something like a Z Entertainment uh, or Bata India, which is seeing a considerable increase in open interest. But, uh, you know, in the terms of its underlying, we are not seeing too much movement. However, when it comes to unwinding, we're seeing, uh, well, 
short covering in Haparo hospitals and longs and bind in Repco Home Finance and United Breweries. Of course, watch out for Labad Bank as well, which has been fairly active as well. So uh, where we are tracking mixed queues, Alex, and we're going to have to keep an eye on the index today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Well, you know, we, we spoke about the fact that crude oil prices have been in a focus. Uh, a major effect uh, of crude oil price increase is on Main Street. Of course, the rupee extended its losses on Wednesday on account of that rise in crude oil prices and uh, the strong uh, dollar demand from importers. The rupee weakened another 25 paise to 70.46 against the US dollar. It had opened on a strong note but then soon plunged to the day's low uh, over sour invest, in, investor sentiment. The surge in crude oil prices also weighed on investor sentiment in the bond market. The 10-year benchmark yield ended slightly higher at 7.47% uh, compared to 7.45% on Tuesday. All right, uh, well, let's talk about the crude oil prices. Now, they've stormed back into bull market territory, rising optimism about OPEC implementing its production cuts and a positive outco uh, outcome of trade talks fueled prices. Now, Bloomberg's energy reporter Aaron Clark filed this report from Tokyo earlier today, speaking about what are the other factors that have led to this rally in crude oil prices. I think there's a few things driving uh, oil surge. Like you said, WTI jumped about 5.2 percent above $52 a barrel uh, yesterday, back into a bull market. Uh, uh, but I think that you know the main driver here is is OPEC, this OPEC plus group led by Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, they said uh, they announced last month they would cut production starting in January by 1.2 million barrels a day uh, to to help, help balance the market. And I think that's really shifted investor sentiment uh, and. Market Market participant, market participant sentiment uh, in the oil market. At the end of last year, you know, we were really seeing people talk about the oversupply and concerned about that. Now people are focused on these cuts by OPEC, and that has shifted, uh, you know, the market sentiment, and, and you're seeing much more bullish uh, overtones. You know, the, the other thing is this group has done it before. Saudi Arabia and, and, and Russia, uh, you know, led cuts back in uh, starting in January of 2017, and they helped balance the market then. So I think there's a lot of uh, they have have a little bit of credibility now with the market and, and folks know that they're focused and intent and going to try to do it again. So I think that's why you're seeing this shift uh, uh, back to a bull market. Yeah, and Saudi Arabia's energy minister Khalid al Falay also pledged yesterday that OPEC Plus would continue to help maintain balance in the markets. I mean, these comments are crucial. It kind of signifies that the market is giving greater credibility or, or belief to what OPEC is saying and doing. Yeah, I mean, he, he basically reiterated what they've been saying is that, you know, they're implementing these cuts. They believe the 1.2 million barrels a day uh, uh, of cutbacks is enough to balance the market. But I think it's given people a lot of confidence. He also went a little bit further. It was interesting. He said, you know, if they need to take further action, they will. So I think, uh, you know, like you said, he's offering a lot of credibility. Folks believe that Russia and Saudi Arabia and the larger OPEC uh, group of countries can get this done because they've done it before. Uh, uh, so, so I think that's really helping, uh, you know, give investors a lot of confidence that these cuts will work and they'll be able to balance the market. All right, now let's uh, look at a comprehensive view of what's making headlines across the globe. Kathleen Hayes of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. North Korean state media say Chinese President Xi Jinping will visit Pyongyang at the invitation of Kim Jong-un. No details have been given about timing. The news came after Kim wrapped up his fourth trip to Beijing in 10 months. China says both Kim and Xi support a second summit between the North Korean leader and U.S. President Donald Trump. Nuclear talks have stalled since their first meeting last June. The U.S. government remains in shutdown mode with President Trump walking out of what he called waste of time talks with Democrat leaders. He tweeted that he asked Nancy Pelosi if she would approve funds for his border wall if he reopened federal agencies for a month. She said no, and so the president walked out. Democrat leaders insist government must restart before wall talks can begin. And he said, "You, if I open up the government, you won't do what I want. That's cruel. That's callous, and that's using millions of innocent people as sort of pawns, and it was wrong. And then, a few minutes later, he sort of slammed the table, 
And when Leader Pelosi said she didn't agree with the wall, he just walked out and said, we have nothing to discuss. Carlos Ghosn's lawyers have officially appealed his detention in a higher court in Tokyo. He's been in jail for more than seven weeks on financial misconduct charges. Reports from Tokyo say Nissan has briefed the French government on its internal investigation of Ghosn. France is a major shareholder in the Renault-Nissan alliance and has been demanding details of the claims against the former chairman. Fiat Chrysler is to pay less than expected to resolve a Justice Department investigation into diesel emissions. The car maker will stump up less than half a billion dollars to end the case, far below the $800 million it had put, earlier put aside. The case alleged some diesel engines violated U.S. clean air regulations, but we're told Fiat Chrysler won't have to admit any wrongdoing as part of the agreement. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and a TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Kathleen Hayes. This is Bloomberg. Well, we're expecting a steady quarter from Tata Consultancy Services, starting off with revenues in rupee terms. We're likely to see a 2.7% uptick quarter on quarter. In dollar terms, we're expecting it to be a little more moderate at around 1.3% because of uh, headwinds in currency. But EBIT margins are expected to stand at around 26.6% against 26.5%. So perhaps a 10 basis points increase and in expansion uh, sequentially in profits are likely to be up by as much as 3.2%. In terms of factors, we are keeping an eye on is the deal wins that were made, made that came through in the, the fourth quarter of uh, FY18 and the first quarter of uh, uh, FY19 is going to carry through and going to remain in strength for TCS. Uh, we've also seen a, a growth which could be partially be over countered by furloughs in the holiday season. But that aside, we're seeing a, a strong deal momentum. We must mention the digital services business which has been so robust and analysts are expecting that to continue its momentum going forward into this financial year as well. Finally, we are expecting the continuation of recovery in BFSI as well as the American uh, geography for uh, Tata Consultancy Services. What we are keeping an eye on is tie-ups in IoT, analytics and cloud services and indications and you know perhaps early ones uh, on client spending and budgets. These are the key watchables that we are going to keep an eye on for TCS but we are expecting a steady quarter from the company this time around. The GST Council in its meeting is going to take up several issues ranging from giving relief to small businesses, allowing the state of Kerala to introduce a disaster relief cess, and also lowering of, rate, lowering of GST rate on under construction properties. As far as relief to small businesses is concerned, the GST Council is going to take up a proposal to increase the minimum, uh, minimum threshold for registering under GST, which currently is Rs 20 lakhs. A ministerial panel was given the task to, uh, to explore what the new income threshold, the new uh, annual, annual turnover limit would be for businesses that have to mandatorily register under GST. Now, the ministerial panel could not arrive at a, uh, at a number or at a, at, a, at a minimum threshold that will be required to register under GST and the task now uh, is on uh, it goes to the GST council and the GST council itself will decide what the new uh, threshold for registering under GST would be. Besides this, the GST Council will also consider uh, uh, introducing the composition scheme which allows taxpayers to pay a flat GST rate whose annual turnover is up to 1.5 crore rupees and this composition scheme would be extended to service providers which currently cannot avail uh, the composition scheme. Uh, besides this, uh, uh, the, the, a ministerial panel which was also tasked to look into whether, the, whether uh, states affected by natural calamity can, uh, can implement or impose a disaster relief cess has, has submitted its report to the GST Council and has allowed the state of Kerala to impose a 1% cess on the value of goods and this cess would, 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 would be for a period of two years and now the GST Council has to give its approval whether, a whether Kerala or any other state in case it's affected by a natural calamity 
can levy this natural uh, can uh, levy this disaster relief cess uh, as, as far as uh, reducing rates on under construction property is concerned, uh, the GST Council is also going to take up this proposal so that so that the, the real estate sector which is affected uh, uh, because of its sales not picking up on under construction properties because now uh, 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 customers who, who plan to buy an under construction property have to pay GST increasing the cost of uh, the purchase. Over to you. Delta Corp came out with its Q3 numbers and they were a decent set of numbers at it. Uh, we saw 27% growth in their Q3 revenues coming in at about 206 crore rupees along with a 13% uh, jump in its bottom line. Margins, however, disappointed coming in at about 40.8%, which is uh, approximately two percentage points lower than the same uh, number last year. Yes Bank will be in focus after the, car, after the lender said that it has submitted an application uh, with the Reserve Bank of India uh, seeking the regulator's approval uh, for the appointment of its new uh, CEO on January 10th, uh, the lender said in a statement. Tata Motors as well would be in focus on the back of a BPC report uh, suggesting that the Jaguar Land Rover is set to cut 5,000 jobs uh, from its 40,000 strong UK, uh, UK workforce as part of its huge $2.5 billion cost-cutting plan. Uh, that apart, Ashok Leyland would be in focus as well after it received a big order for the supply of 2,580 buses uh, from three state transport undertakings. Uh, Dilip Bildcon, uh, watch out for that as well as the company's subsidiary has achieved uh, financial closure for its six-laning highway project in Andhra Pradesh worth more than 2,000 crore rupees. Uh, also, apart from that, we will be watching out for Bhushan Steel, uh, which, uh, which, according, which according to its press release has said that it would be raising uh, approximately 24,000 crore rupees from Tata Steel via the issue of preferential, sh preferential shares uh, on, a private, uh, on a private placement basis. All right. Thanks so much for that, Yash. Well, there's clearly so many stocks to look forward to in trade today, and uh, you'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. Uh, there are also several stories on the website, BloombergQuint.com, that you'll find if you log on right now. First up, a probe by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs into the accounts and operations of Vakrangi have found no irregularity in matters pertaining to the resignation of its auditor and abnormal trading in the company's stock, among other issues. The financial services provider said this in an exchange filing yesterday. And in a global news, uh, Theresa May is openly contemplating a Brexit Plan B amid growing concerns or signs that the British Parliament will reject the deal that she's reached with the European Union and try to take charge of what happens next. Yesterday, the Prime Minister suffered her second defeat in two days of uh, in the House of Commons, losing control of the timetable for setting out the next steps if, as expected, Parliament votes down her Brexit deal on the 15th of January. Well, that's all we have for you in this edition of Daybreak, but all you need to know is... That's all, rather, that's all you need to know. This is all you need to know. I forgot about that. Do stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint. Uh, there's a lot more on the other side.